Let's take a deeper look at Telemachus. This is one of the easier chapters in the book, but it does have its challenges, and especially if you are just starting out on the book, this will have a you're still figuring out what Joyce is doing and how he works. Even though I've read this chapter many times, I still discover a lot of new things, so I enjoyed reading it and I'm enjoying getting back into it. There are plenty of annotations in this chapter. There are a lot more later on though, and there are much more difficult chapters, but if you can learn to separate what is important and what is just off-the-wall references, He'll be, Joyce will be referencing a lot of different things and you can use the annotations, but it'll also have characters that he talks about who may or may not show up later in the book. I think in this chapter, most of them don't show up. So you're, you may be kind of confused, like, is this an important character? Do I need to keep this character in mind? Or is this some just casual reference? And for the most part in this chapter, I would say they are casual references. However, Joyce is very good at threading things throughout the book and linking them up. So they may not be hugely significant, but he's good at connecting anything to anything else. And that's, uh, I think, one of the ideas that comes from Ulysses. On the very first page, we have this imitation of the Catholic mass that Buck Mulligan does. He's up on the top of the tower and he's going to shave and he carries the, the bowl. And I didn't go to Catholic church, but I, I'm familiar enough with the concept that I get it. And <laughs> um, just know that he's mocking it. If you really want to know this chapter's art, that I said there was that schema, is theology, so Joyce is mocking that a little. Stephen will talk about, in this chapter, how he is the servant of two masters, one being uh, England, which has dominion over Ireland, but the other is the Catholic Church. This is a, a very Catholic country at the time, but people like Buck Mulligan and Stephen are not certainly not above mocking it and parroting it. So we're going to see that. And I think, though, we can relate to it today, even though we're not wherever you are. Maybe you are a colony. I don't know. But uh, I'm not living in a country that is colonized by another country. But I think we can still relate in the sense that we are at the uh, bidding to a degree of things like governments and corporations. So that is something that is still very relevant. Throughout this chapter, Joyce is going to be touching on a lot of these cultural influences that are eroding the old order, the old way of things. So he'll talk about, um, he'll quote William Butler Yeats, this Fergus poem, and he'll talk about Oscar Wilde and Matthew Arnold, this cultural critic. He'll talk about the Superman of Nietzsche, that concept. And I don't know if he touches on it too much in this chapter, but he will touch on Darwin later on and how that's um, eroding the literal interpretation of the Bible and things like that. All these cultural forces though are at work and that's the milieu that Joyce is landing his characters in as they um, try to figure out what to do with their lives, how to have an influence on the world. These are things you know that we're still addressing of course all the time as culture, culture wars, things like that. So Joyce is just situating his characters in that world. Joyce will also be dropping some hints or, I said threads, things that connect to other chapters, although you probably won't realize a lot of them in this book, I mean this book, in this chapter, because uh, they haven't been introduced yet. So Haynes, who seems like a pretty well-educated guy, he's a nice guy and, and all that, but at the same time, he represents this really, uh, he's from Oxford, he's, he's this really well-educated, kind of rich guy, and he um, he's in, enlightened in the sense that he has these modern ideas, but at the same time, he is a, a person of his class and his position in the world. And he has these ideas, too, about uh, German Jews taking over England that he wants to help prevent. So he's, he's certainly a person of his time. And I think that he's going to be linking that, that anti-Semitism is going to be linked to... Um, I think Joyce is setting up the introduction of Leopold Bloom, who is Jewish. And we're going to see that in the next chapter, too, with Stephen's boss, who's also pretty anti-Semitic. In this chapter, we see this dream that, this, that Haynes has. And um, he dreams about this panther and how he has to shoot it. And I think that was a... I never thought about, like... I mean, I thought about it, but I, I never really understood what it might mean. And I think my best guess is that 
Joyce is trying to say that this is what the colonial experience is like. You have this person come into your home and uh, they could have these ideas about what is dangerous and what is right and what is wrong and they could shoot something and that's kind of crazy, right? Somebody just comes into your house and has this dream and is going to shoot something that doesn't even exist. That's my interpretation of what the dream means. And now as this chapter progresses, we're going to start to see Stephen uh, use something, not really an interior monologue. I don't think it's fair to call it quite an interior monologue because this one paragraph in particular where this, uh, they're talking about this bullying in this incident that happened somewhere in the past that Mulligan and Stephen know about. They refer to this character, Clive Kempthorpe, who got a thrashing or something. And there's this almost sexual nature to it. We, we're not quite clear what happened and we're never going to be quite clear what happens because uh, as Joseph Campbell describes it, when Joyce gives you this look inside a person's head, he just gives it to you raw and you don't, he's not explaining it to you. He's just as the character experiences it. So it's a series of images and poetic memories, dialogue jumbled. It's very unclear and you can read it several times and try to get as much understanding of it as you can, but I don't think you're going to ever have the exact understanding that Stephen does. And that's what Joyce wanted. He wants you to really know that sometimes, uh, things that, uh, people are experiencing, it's their personal, it's like an in joke, you know, they can try to explain it to you, but they're never going to get the full meaning across to you. Joyce makes it apparent in this chapter, really to my mind that Stephen is very guilty and very, uh, morbidly uh, obsessed with what happened with his mother's death, how he didn't pray when she wanted him to pray. It's something that's going to just linger throughout the book and build and build. And there's a point in this chapter where there's this guy at it who drowned out at sea, who's just lost at sea. And I think that's just a way, um, we'll see that in Proteus in a few chapters. It's just something that uh, is a, another metaphor for Stephen's state of mind. He's, he's like floating dead out at sea. There's also this feeling that the past and the future are constantly uh, mixing with the present. The present isn't just right here. It's, it has the past. I think Faulkner said something like uh, the past is, you can't, I don't know, like you can't move past the past it's not even past or something, something like that. Very Faulknerian. It's, it's not even past. The past is always with us. And so is the future. Everything is contained in the present moment. In some ways, this chapter feels a little overwritten to me because Joyce published this book serially. He would have it in the magazine form, but he would go back and change a lot. But he, for the most part, he kind of knew the outline of the book and he, he left room for adding things. I was looking at the last sentence, for example, in uh, the little review as it originally was published. If you read, or actually the second to last sentence where he talks about Mulligan out swimming and he compares him to a seal. He says like his head was out bobbing in the water, like a seals or something. Or I don't think he says like a seal. He just says a seals, a metaphor. And in the original, that, that wasn't there. He just had a form out in the water. He doesn't. And then Joyce just added that little detail and he does that throughout the book. And apparently about one third of the book I've heard is added at the proofs stage of, uh, when he, when Joyce had the proofs, he would just pencil in all these little notes and things that he wanted, usually part of the interior monologue. And, um, I think that's just Joyce's method. He's dropping hints. He's setting things up. He talks at the end, he says like, I'll see you dudes later at the ship. The ship is a bar or tavern where they're going to meet. That's all you need to know. If you're confused, what's the ship? It's a bar, the end. But also he talks about Stephen's lecture. So he's, he's casting these things out there for you to get ready if uh, you weren't ready. We saw it in A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, but also even more so in Ulysses that Stephen is trying to uh, make a living and but do so in a meaningful way. There's hints that he could, and later on when he goes to the newspaper office in Aeolus, he's going to be, they're going to say like, maybe you should work with us. You'd be a dandy good reporter. They don't say that, but um, 
they they say that maybe you should do something a little more practical and uh you see it here too when he talks to Haynes he's like can I make some money with my witticisms and um he's w always walking this line between like what can I how can I survive but also how can I use my artistic vision he seems to like people like Mulligan seem to know that he has this vast um understanding of literature and of doing something really significant but um, very few people can see it so Mulligan is in a sense Joyce I mean uh, Stephen kind of sees him as an enemy but he's also a friend and he sees his vision I would call them frenemies you, you can use that modern term it's a very accurate description Stephen is is throughout the book looking for something that can hold his vision the title of this chapter Telemachus to connect it to the Odyssey, let me explain that. So Telemachus was the son of Odysseus, the hero of the Odyssey. He's, um, I think in the Odyssey, he's two years old. Wait, that sounds right. I think he's two years old when Odysseus leaves to the war. And then uh, the war ends 10 years later. And then he, Odysseus wanders for 10 more years. So when he finally is going to be heading home, he's about 22, which is Stephen's age. Penelope, Telemachus's mother and Odysseus's wife, has all these suitors coming in her house saying like, your husband, he's dead, you need to get married again. Why don't you marry one of, one of us cool dudes? Telemachus doesn't have the father figure. And Stephen, in a sense, has a father. In fact, in this book, his father, Simon Daedalus, shows up and he's just across town. They nearly cross paths several times. But Stephen doesn't go home and he doesn't want to see his father. And there's this feeling that he doesn't have a spiritual like father. So Bloom is kind of going to take that role. So Joyce is doing all these little variations on this theme of the absent father. And also he's doing this thing because his mother is dead. She's the one that's like, Stephen is kind of sees as lost. But these parallels, they're very loose. And, you know, Stephen's also Hamlet and all this other stuff. So they're very loose. Joyce is just um, playing with these things. The chapter ends with the word usurper. And that kind of relates to this idea that Telemachus has all these uh, suitors in his house. And um, Buck Mulligan can be seen as one of those suitors. This is again another very loose analogy because after all Buck Mulligan isn't in Stephen's home. Stephen's in Buck Mulligan's home. It's a reversal. And to be honest Mulligan is actually a breath of fresh air to be after a portrait of the artist which is has all these very serious characters, very little joking. Suddenly Joyce starts introducing a lot more witty characters and I think they're really a breath of fresh air. So there's Mulligan, there's Blazes Boylan, Simon Daedalus is pretty witty, Lanahan. They're going to fill this book, and I think they make it a much more comedic book. But we get two more chapters of Stephen before Joyce decides to really shift the focus and uh, take the book in quite a few new directions. My suggestion for this chapter is just read it. If you hit a really difficult reference, look it up in the annotations. Otherwise, just keep reading and, you know, follow my notes here. But... There's also, I found recently, a really good uh, dramatization of Ulysses that is actually not a, not a dramatization. It's not an adaptation. It's complete. And it really is good at shifting. They have a cast. So like Buck Mulligan has his own actor and Stephen is his own actor and so on. But also they do these things when it shifts to an interior monologue. So you really know that this is Stephen's interior monologue. And I, I think it's pretty good. I've been listening to it. And if you, after reading this, are still a little confused, you might want to listen to that. But otherwise, I'm going to go on to the next chapter, which is Nestor.